All right, we're live. Welcome to Dive Into World Building. Sorry, we're getting a late start today. Today's topic is uh, natural disasters. So I think this is going to be really, really fun. Um, in part because there are so many different natural disasters and they're so different and the way that you respond to them is so different and they're so dependent on all kinds of various factors about the climate and geography, right? Um, and then, then the other part is that people have these very specific kinds of responses to natural disasters and natural disaster storytelling is something that's something that I hope that we can talk about later. Um, because everybody's got a story about that natural disaster that I was in. <laughs> you were in, and everybody was in. So what happened to you? <laughs> kind of thing. So, um, yeah. I live in California. So the very obvious candidate for natural disasters here is earthquakes. Um, and I know people who say, well, I'm not ever going to live in California because... <laughs> Earthquakes. <laughs> um, you know, the funny thing, though, is that that when I went to Florida, I was at one point interviewing for a position at the University of Florida. And I remember walking around, and I was like, how could I live here because I'm in coals? <laughs> oh, but that's exactly like the response people have to earthquakes, right? <laughs> Um, you know, they, they kind of sort of guess that they're happening all the time, which they kind of are, except that, that you don't notice them. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the one of the interesting characteristics of at least earthquakes is that you don't necessarily notice them because trucks drive by your house relatively regularly, and then and, and that shakes the ground, too. So, you know... Um, if you look at, if you ever go and you look at like the seismology of the area for the last five days or something, you'll find that there are like all these earthquakes happening all the time, um, but nobody noticed because none of them were particularly big. Um, so yeah, and then of course there's Oklahoma where they're suddenly getting earthquakes now. Um, Parts of Texas too. Texas too, yeah, I find that much more troubling. Actually, I mean, I'm I'm used to these earthquakes. I know what to expect, right? Yeah. And we're all trained. We're all trained in school. <laughs> you know. I don't think you're trained for sinkholes. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there well, and Florida also gets the hurricanes too. I um, I went to school in Savannah and. We would get like the hurricane warnings, and people would be like, "Oh, we're gonna have to evacuate." And thank God we never did. But apparently, after I left, uh -huh. um, the, the school did get they did get evacuated. I had friends who were like, "Yeah, we had to go evacuate." Because I'm just like stubborn. I'm like, "They're not moving me. <laughs> I'm not leaving." <laughs> <clears throat> well, it is interesting. You know, hurricanes are something that you can predict. Mm -hmm. Um. And you can prepare for and you can train people for them. Um, you know, it's interesting. So can you know, can you can you predict? Can you can you be trained? <laughs> um, I wonder about um, uh, tornadoes. Uh, there's uh, they can do some prediction now, but it's and until the last few minutes, they don't really know where it specifically it's going to go. Yeah. Oh, here where I am in San Antonio, we're technically at the very tail end of Tornado Alley, but all we get are the little ones. Mm. There's very hardly ever any much damage to speak of. Mm. I think maybe there should be like two categories then, like the sort of predictable ones and then the ones that come out of nowhere. Or at least like if you have the technology, you can predict it. Yeah. Because otherwise, you know, stuff, you know, way back when used to just happen like to people. Yeah, hurricanes weren't predictable 
are weren't very predictable a hundred years ago. Yeah. Technology definitely improves prediction. Um, well, you know, we've got modern technology has given us the ability, I think, to predict tsunamis, um, but only by a few minutes. Yeah. yeah. Which is kind of <laughs> scary. <laughs> well, there is, you know, it's it's funny because, like, you know, like stuff stuff happens on shore during a tsunami. Like, tide goes way, 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 way out. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, that to me says run for the hills. But people well, you are know, like wandering the beach. That's like, the ooh. thing about the training aspect of it, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I. So, so like one of the things that they tell you, and you probably know this, um, Che, because you're in California. One of the things they tell you in California is, when the ground starts to shake go immediately to the very, very closest safe spot that you can identify and stay there until it stops, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, don't try to go anywhere because you can't predict the effect that the earthquake will have on other sections of your path towards where you think you might be safe. So um, they always tell us, you know, go through your house and identify a spot in each room where you will go if it starts shaking, right? I thought it was usually just stand in the door. The Doorways like, are highly recommended. Stand in the um, doorway, yeah. But, you know, I mean, there are exceptions to that. I've heard, mm. I've heard recently that if you can get into a corner mm. um, mm. by a wall, that that's a good, that's a good approach. Uh, you know, things like stay away from glass. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Also, like, I'm here at my desk, and I'm completely hosed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Seriously, I'm like, dude, like, where is a corner without crap in it or books? Like, yeah. So, yeah. like, you know, if it starts shaking right now, I'm going to have to leave very rapidly from this spot. <laughs> all my books will fall on my head. <laughs> Yes, you do not want to be next to bookcases or other tall shelves. Well, you know, and they do sell they do sell uh, ties that allow you to tie your tall cabinets to the wall. Oh my God, I thought you said pies. <laughs> no, um, that sounds delicious, but no. <laughs> ties, like <laughs> oh my right, cat bar ties. <laughs> You, they, you know, or or brackets. The other thing that they, that they do is brackets, yeah. um, where you know you'll you'll actually have a little L bracket and you'll screw it down into the top of your cabinet and then screw it into the wall behind hmm. to anchor your cabinet in case things get hairy. Because <laughs> yeah. sometimes we're, it's really a big one. It's kind of like taking your house and turning it on the side. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I think that also depends on, like, the area, because it's, like, you have to be <clears throat> close enough to, like, the major fault lines. Like, we hardly feel anything here. Like, we get, like, a little shaking once in a while, but yeah. most of it, just nothing. Nothing. Yeah. It's almost disappointing, really. <laughs> I've only felt, like, maybe two, two or three since I've lived <laughs> here, and that's been, like, a really long time. Yeah. Well, so so I was in the '89 earthquake, um, the the big one, and that it was a 7.2, I believe, that ha hit in the San Francisco area. And I was at in college, and I will tell you that is about as large an earthquake as I care to experience, <laughs> though I don't really have any choice. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that's really interesting about a natural disaster like an earthquake is that the amount of damage is going to depend a great deal on the way that things are constructed. So this is actually natural disasters and their effects are really linked to what kind of infrastructure is in place and whether there are building codes, for example. Um, yeah. And whether there are uh, water pipes, <laughs> right? Um, or, or gas pipelines, which 
you know, one of the major causes of fire after an earthquake is when gas pipelines rupture. So one of the things that homeowners are taught to do is to have a wrench next to their gas uh, meter and go out and turn the darn thing off if there's been a large earthquake um, until they can get it checked. Yeah. So, but I mean, so you can have um, you can have an earthquake, quite a strong one here in California, and you can have very few people die and and very few buildings fall. And then you can have, you know, a much smaller earthquake happen somewhere where people are living in earthen, within earthen walls, and all of a sudden you've gotten these huge swaths of, of, of destroyed buildings and, you know, rubble everywhere and people dying all over the place, you know, because... <clears throat> yeah. Oh, but the other thing is, Tall buildings, because Brian just mentioned tall buildings. Um, tall buildings are designed to sway. Yeah. Because if they didn't, they would fall. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I believe some of that same construction is used in hurricane-prone areas. Well, They're also that. designed yeah. to have a certain amount of sway with the wind. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, Did you I know? remember... Hearing about an earthquake in Chile, where all the glass in the skyscraper shattered and rained down on the people below, just yikes! Yeah. That happens. Them into pieces. Yeah. Like the Matrix, only it's real. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Wait, what? The Matrix wasn't real. <laughs> <laughs> which which pill did you choose? <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking notes. I have an excuse. <laughs> um, um, in, in terms of constructing things to deal with uh, natural disasters, there's an interesting technique in some areas of the Netherlands mm -hmm. where the, the houses are not actually built on foundations. Mm. They're built attached to anchors and when a serious flood happens, the house will lift up with the flood. It has flotation tanks underneath it. It remains anchored in situ, and then you just, as the flood waters go down, you just crank back in and lock it back <laughs> down in place. They need that in New Orleans, man. Yeah. It's a bit difficult to retrofit. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. I think they started building more things there on... Um, like stilts, so everything's yeah. like much higher off the ground. Yeah, you, you park your car and have a storage area at ground level, but the house is. Yeah. Yeah, you see that all along the Gulf Coast and many other places that are prone to uh, occasional but severe floods like that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's actually, um, there was flooding the Thames, what, last year or something? Flooded really badly. So, there are the occasional natural disasters in England. <laughs> Wait, uh, the, Tem the Thames should have only flooded outside the Thames barrier. They built a huge, great, go, go look it up on Google. It's an impressive piece of construction. Yeah. Stops tidal surges from going up into the main part of, uh, of London. So yeah, I don't think it was London. I areas. think it was outside London because it was like people's like <laughs> homes and stuff. People were having to kind of like. Live. We've had. I mean, I I've lived in areas. I I lived in a place when I lived in England. The house I lived in was maybe twelve, maybe fifteen feet above sea level, if that. Um, and on a couple of occasions, we did have flooding problems, and it wasn't like you know water. Um, rushing down, you know, a, a flooded creek like you tend to get here after heavy rains. It wasn't even just, you know, a big river steadily uh, spreading out over the floodplain. It was water welling up out of the ground. Wow. Mm. The water table was so so sodden, and more rain was falling, and 
there was literally nowhere else for it to go, and um, <laughs> stuff was running off nearby hillsides into the floodplain, and the, the, the water in the floodplain was just rising until it was above ground level. Yeah. Wow. There's not a lot you can do about that. Yeah, they're they're looking at uh, putting those kind of tidal barriers, or looking at the possibility of putting those kind of tide barriers around New York City, but there's like three places they'd have to put them in. That's a lot of coastline too, isn't it? I mean, well, they'd still. I think that it would still the s southern edge of Long Island would still be vulnerable, mm -hmm. but it would protect Manhattan and and some other places. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there'd have to. There's <laughs> like two places down below Manhattan, and then one up between. Um, Long Island and Connecticut that they'd have, and one of them would be, have to be really huge and long. And so, so let's see for a second if we can make a list of all these things that we've been talking about. So, we have earthquake, and we have flood, and we have hurricane. Yep. Tornado. Tornado. Tsunami. Wildfire. Tsunami. Yeah. Volcano okay. eruption. Oh, volcanic eruption. <laughs> yeah. Have Blizzard. you guys seen? Um, oh, I wonder if I can find that video and put it in yeah. my report. Have you guys seen the video uh, of of um, the reconstruction of Mount Vesuvius? No. Oh man, it's so incredible, Pompeii. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go see if I can find the Pompeii video cool. and put it in the report. I'm fascinated by Santorini, but that's a little farther back. Yeah. Well, they, they basically they made a like a, a computer dramatization of Pompeii. Hmm. Um, and I'm going to see if I can put it in the report because it is the coolest thing. I mean, hmm, quite astonishing, really. Yeah. Um, let's see. <laughs> what was going on? Basically, if you were there, you were host. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's kind of like, it's like, you know, as, like, if you want to look for, like, world building, like, an ancient culture, I mean, you know, is the, the, the mountain is smoking. Do you run for it, <laughs> stay and appease the gods, or just <laughs> ignore it because you'd, like, oh, that thing always smokes every once in a while? Um... <laughs> Well, and there's basically two types of volcanoes, too. Some that erupt very explosively mm -hmm. uh -huh. and produce a lot of airborne ash and rocks and things, and the ones that produce more of just a slow, thick lava that just flows and flows and flows. <laughs> and flows, and then you're toast. But usually you have time to get away from that. Yeah, the yeah. slow moving. That's like the the Hawaiian volcanoes are the slow yeah. moving lava. Um, it's the explosive ones that uh, Mount St. Helens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, that's an interesting, actually, um, a piece of art. Have you guys seen uh, Fantasia two thousand? No. No, I was watching the original the other night, but I've never seen it. Fantasia 2000, um, the, last, the last segment is oh, yeah. a section from, from The Firebird by a French animator. And basically they, um, they did this animated sequence to The Firebird that, that was essentially about the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Mm -hmm. And it was actually really cool. <laughs> I mean, great example of of world building in a, in in art in a sense because it wasn't. I don't know. I couldn't recognize the mountain per se, right? But you had these the the spirit of spring, and then you had the firebird who was like the spirit of the of the fiery mountain and all this kind of stuff. Really, really well handled, and and obviously not something that's done in writing, but it was cool. Um, <clears throat> and watching it gives me goosebumps. <laughs> so I highly recommend that you find it just for that piece. I have read speculation that the um, 
if you trace back in time far enough, the ultimate roots of all the Abrahamic religions, in other words, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, come from a group of people who lived in an area with volcanoes because of all the imagery about the glowing light on top of the mountain. Mm. Wow. It's speculation, what I've read. I don't know how well-founded it is, but it's an interesting thought how that what? could affect the, the mythology and belief systems. Well, I think in, in comparative mythology, there's like a whole subfield studying that and um, how uh, <laughs> geography and natural phenomenon would have impacted the myths. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's gonna it's gonna end up having a huge impact on culture, right? Yeah. Especially if things are happening very often. Actually, I'm gonna put in a plug for N.K. Jemison's uh, forthcoming book, The Fifth Season, um, because one of the things she's dealing with is natural disaster. She's got this highly seismically active uh, world. Yeah. Where every so often the world just kind of turns itself <laughs> inside out, and you have to start over. Um, and she's dealing with, I think, magic in that context, but also just looking at the way the culture has to change and renew itself, and and how people, um, how people survive in a place where there there's always this constant possibility of just death, <laughs> death yeah. by stuff you can't control. Um, she's also got this magic where people actually, some people can actually control or influence the seismic activity. Um, I'm really looking forward to this thing coming out, needless to say. <laughs> That's going to be really cool. Um, but let's see, do we have any more to add to our list? What about blizzards? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Landslides, mudslides. Yeah, Atlantic. forest fires. Forest fires, yeah. And actually rocks coming out of the sky. I mean, they don't have to be huge to make things really yeah. difficult for people. Oh, yeah, it's our asteroids. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> cataclysmic. Well, you can have non-cataclysmic asteroids, right? No, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. They, they, they don't... Like that one that exploded over Russia a few years yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. You know, and they now, they now have those explosions. <laughs> Poles in Russia, right? Yeah. If your if your planet happens to be in an orbit that every now and then, every what uh, x number of years brings it close to another planet, and spores from that other planet cross the gap <laughs> and start falling, <laughs> and you and you have to breed dragons to deal with it. <laughs> it's a natural disaster. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, actually, that's a really great way of, 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 of bringing that up, Brian. <laughs> well, like, uh, made up, made up, invented, invented natural disaster. No, it was it's an such an integral part of the world disaster. building. And at yeah. first, you don't that's understand the... it. You know, you don't know what it is. And that's because the people, you know, that she's writing about don't know what it is because they've lost their history and so forth. They've, they've lost the reason why the dragons... And you even have it starts with the thing where the thread hasn't happened for the cycles it was supposed to because there's been orbital per perturbations. And then it comes back and they're not ready for it. Yeah. Um, it's It's... You know, I'm, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of those books. There's much to question about them. But that kind of world building, the yeah. way that that's constructed yeah. and, and delivered, is superb. Yeah. yeah well, yes, yeah, there's all kind of astronomical events. If, if you have an unstable sun mm -hmm. that, that's really active and sends off really dramatic solar flares frequently yeah. and, and uh... well you know that reminds me solar flares um, what do you call those electromagnetic uh, storms or something you know how they... the EMPs the electromagnetic pulse that's supposed to that kill all our modern technology, technology. <laughs> Did you guys count? Want to count lightning strikes? Yeah. 
Who, really like who, a disaster goes, who whoever Severe thunderstorms it. goes with the whole lightning strikes, hail, flash flooding, which is a little different from coastal flooding. It manifests a little differently. And yeah. uh, tornadoes actually belong in that clump of events that they right. can go together. Because <clears throat> right. large hail can be very destructive. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. There was a little video that was going around the other day that had a, some storm chasers that encountered like baseball sized hail. Yeah. <laughs> and they broke their windshield. Yeah, exactly. It broke their windshield, and that was kind of the end of their driving. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I said we're at the very tail end of Tornado Alley here, so we don't get a lot of tornadoes, but we get a ton of hail damage. Hmm. Uh, in fact, there's a local car dealer right now having a hail of a sale. Oh, God. Seriously? That's Seriously. Terrible. That's terrible. Oh, and hilarious. From the storm that hit here a couple of weeks ago. You know, tornadoes were new to the Europeans who came here. Yeah. Because Europe has mountains that, that go... Across. What, what, left to right, east to west. Mm. Yeah, like too many, and so they've never had it. So they came here, and all of a sudden, it's like holy crap! Oh, oh yeah, North America has more tornadoes than the rest of the world put together. Yeah, it's because it's because we only it's have like the, the, the one the, mountain range coming straight down. So there's yeah. nothing there's nothing buffering over the Great Plains, like nothing. Yeah, <laughs> nothing, and then you're <laughs> toast. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh well, yeah, that has all kind of effects on weather here. In the winter, we get what we call blue northers, which is a cold front that blows in very, very strong and can drop the temperature 30, 40, 50 degrees in like an hour. Wow. Wow. And uh, you know, that's what we say. Well, there's nothing. Be there's nothing between here and the North Pole. <laughs> yeah. Well, polar vortex comes to mind as a result of that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and and oh, natural disasters. Anyone? Drought. Yeah. Okay. Drought. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I will have you know that we've just finished our whole front yard, redoing it. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> To be drought resistant, yay! Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, Jay, what's the day after tomorrow? Oh, that movie where um, there were like super storms from like the North Pole. They were like hurricanes, only with ice, and they froze everything from like in like the northern hemisphere. Oh, okay. It was a good movie. It's not like amazing, but it's a very good movie. I mean, just entertaining. Like, Ice it's a good storm. disaster film. Um, Ice megastorms, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, oh, so yeah, ice caps melting. Global warming. Global yeah. Global warming, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a pretty big disaster. Yeah. I, I wonder if that would be a disaster because that, like, it takes a long, long time to, I mean, they don't just melt instantly. Well, again, if you had an uns a, a more irregular orbit or more um, unstable sun, mm -hmm. you could have a, a more naturally extreme global temperature changes. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, what? actually, um, the the question about um, the global warming uh, as disaster. I was just, it led me to think about the perspective of what does it mean for a disaster. Like, um, does it okay. have to be sudden? Is that what you're asking? No, it doesn't have to be sudden, but like, it, it may also be a matter of perspective. So, like, for example, with the volcano, volcanoes might be a better example of what I'm thinking about here. Um, so, okay, so above ground, you know, the sentient living creatures. Um, running around that are in its wake are like probably like 
it's bad. It's a disaster for them. But then you have this thing where sometimes the heat from the volcano, the volcanic um, lava, that <laughs> magma chamber <laughs> um, that goes and drips into the sea, oh. sort of can create life forms. So that's maybe not a disaster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have something that also, while it's killing all this stuff above ground, is contributing to new life forms. And, and also around a, a, a volcano, it's like Yellowstone, which mm -hmm. is actually a big volcano caldera, and there's this huge giant magma chamber underneath it. Yeah, and yeah. When it's not erupting, it's producing a lot of heat that produces the geysers and the the little hot bubbling pools. And, yeah. Which has a. a probably a beneficial effect on the life in that area. Yeah. Well, it, life is all about living on that thin edge, right? Yeah. <laughs> Taking advantage of the whatever you can get. Um, but and, I, and doesn't Iceland have different. a lot of natural hot springs? Sorry? Doesn't mm. Iceland mm. have natural yeah. hot springs and yeah. hot pools? and? Japan does as well. Yeah. Didn't didn't Iceland also have, or was it Greenland that had like that volcano that buried the village sort of slowly and like canceled air travel out of Europe a few years ago That's because awesome. of the ash fall? Yeah. I was awesome. Okay. Okay. Yeah. A Yarfjallajökull or thereabouts. <laughs> yeah. That volcano I can't pronounce. I I don't think I would even try. I would have to. <laughs> I heard it pronounced uh, in Icelandic, and it was very cool. Uh, yes. I can't it. <laughs> well, and Mount Fuji is a volcano, or was. I don't know if it's extinct or dormant. Uh, do Fuji is dormant, as I know. Dormant. As, okay. as I know, yeah. That's good then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fortunately. Um, <laughs> Is that Mount Rainier is only um, is only dormant as well. It's not extinct. So, well, I mean, if you look at island chains, they're often created by uh, a volcanic hotspot moving underneath a tectonic plate. Yep, that's how Hawaii well, got well, there and much of the Pacific Rim. The hot spot stays put in the plate. And the plate moves yeah, faster, the plates yes. move. <laughs> I should have said moving relative to instead of <laughs> <laughs> They're both moving relative to something else that's somewhere else in the universe. Yeah. Yeah. So I just I want to talk about disaster movies like so bad. <laughs> Well, well, yeah, let's do that. Be all, all on your own for that, because I don't know anything about disaster movies. <laughs> let's talk about 2012 and how... Oh, no, that was the worst movie ever. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. No, let's not. Let's talk about, like, a good one. Like, okay. Okay. Okay, like, like speaking of, like, completely mythical, made-up natural disasters, you guys, um, Reign of Fire, where, like, dragons, like, after millions upon millions of years, surfaced. Oh my god, not Sharknado. Um, <laughs> Sharknado. Like, oh god. If Sharknado isn't a natural planet. disaster, I don't know what is. What about <laughs> Rain of Frogs? <laughs> well, unless they're poisonous. Well, they had, reason, they had Rain of Spiders recently in Australia. But I'm sure they yeah. were just tiny. Probably. I very carefully <laughs> didn't <laughs> read about really, that. So, I mean... God knows, it's like... Well, if but, in Australia, I don't even want to think about spiders. <laughs> <laughs> They've got some nasty ones. I've been there, you know, you don't you don't meet nasty spiders every day. Okay. So it's really okay. <laughs> no, it, uh, it's only Mondays and Thursdays that it's spiders, because the other days you've got to fit in the snakes, the jellyfish, the sharks. <laughs> I used to watch Crocodile Hunter. I was scarred by that. <laughs> oh, God. You know, I, I it's think... not a good example. As I understand it, people do... Um, like, the lifeguards will wear nylons. Um, 
to keep the jellyfish off them. Mm. Oh, that's wow. The only thing that I can think of that people literally take precautions to avoid because it's so likely kind of thing. Whereas yeah. all this other stuff is like... <laughs> Nobody encounters that, you guys. <laughs> I'm seriously filing that away for like future reference. If I ever get in the water in Australia, I will wear nylons. <laughs> I think they should. I think you should go beyond that. I think you should kind of basically be looking for a Priscilla Queen of the Desert set up here, and yeah. just you know, <laughs> full <laughs> outfits with the headdresses and everything. I think yeah, that's the way. Yeah, I know you want that long dress, there. um, Brian. Sandstorm. Speaking of the desert. Mm -hmm. oh, the oh, good one, Glenda. Nice job. Well, I'm thinking about natural disasters and like fictional settings and what that does. And often, I think that I mean, we talked about how it impacts in infrastructure in terms of like what kind of natural disasters are possible earlier. But I was thinking about like because um, it's a theme in film, like things like Armageddon or like you know, the, like either there's okay, so there's a natural disaster, it's coming, and people then develop tools or techniques to combat that, right? Yeah. Um, like, we won't talk about the merits of what was done in those settings, but I just was thinking about that in terms of tools. Like with sandstorms, there's must be like certain fabrics, right, that people who travel in deserts use to keep themselves from basically being smothered, right? Well, yeah. I think you just have to like um, have like a really sturdy tent and kind of make a hollow, and I I imagine like. Probably the thicker the better. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Normally uh, you can yeah, you can just hunker down and cover your nose and mouth and the sandstorm yeah. is it would be an unusual sandstorm that's so thick that there what still wasn't enough air for you to breathe. The problem is the yeah. particulate. So as long as you've got some sort of screen over your nose and mouth. Um yeah, yeah we get um windstorms and sandstorms sometimes down here. Um they they can be serious. I mean, do you? We were driving back once um, and hit one, and the visibility dropped from you know being able to see you know 50 miles to being able to see 50 feet, just like that. Yeah. Um, it's they are abrupt and quite terrifying if you're not expecting them, and people do crash in them on a regular basis yeah. because they keep trying to drive, and uh, other people have not continue to drive and are just stopped in the middle of the road, which is not. <laughs> it, yeah. It, it happens. It happens. Well, I mean, there's, 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 there's signs up telling you what to do, but as soon as it hits, you can't see the signs. So, yeah. You have to be reading when you can see the signs. <laughs> yeah. You're supposed to pull over and stop. Um, and what some people do the stopping thing without the pulling over thing, and then a semi just goes straight through them from behind. Mm. Or do they even know if they're off the road, though? I mean, it's it could be difficult. But yeah. yeah, yeah. It's I, I mean it is. I a dust storm, but I, I was very small. I don't remember it very well. Um, I was going to mention, you know, we have huge, giant, multi-car accidents in California when there's fog. Fog, oh, yeah. Um, or, I think they or, call it Thule fog. Yeah. Down or here. even just yeah. rain sometimes. Yeah. Because Californians what's, can't drive in weather. What's interesting about that in terms of that it fog itself being a disaster is like maybe that fog itself would not necessarily be a disaster if it were not for the technology that mm -hmm. we're driving cars. Yeah. You know what That's I mean? That's what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, like you I mean obviously like you have to stay still and, and just, you know, slow down things without you know what I mean? If we were on horseback or whatever, because still you can't see, but... Mm -hmm. Yep. Come here. Come here. Well, I was gone all day long, and the cats are very needy. Stars, <laughs> <laughs> you right, Glenda. You shouldn't go out so long. <laughs> um, so, yeah, okay. So, so I wanted to admit, I want to make sure I mention this one thing. Before you know, before we get too late in the hour, and that is that um, culturally speaking, 
disasters are things that bring people together. Um, there's, there's, you know, when, when everything's been shaken up or everything's kind of gone crazy, there's this enormous reaching out by all these people to say, are you okay? Are you okay? Um, you know, what happened? Where were you? All this kind of stuff. I mean, the one thing that I remember from my childhood and whenever there was an earthquake of any measurable, noticeable size was that the phone lines would all of a sudden be completely tied up because people have this immediate instinct to reach out and try to figure out if everybody they know is okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe oh, God. that in fact with the Nepal earthquake I saw Facebook offering a service where you could check in on people yeah. using telephones. Yeah. And I thought that was really clever. Um, and I know, yeah, in recent years around the U.S., they've told people don't, especially with cell phones, is don't try to call people, just text. Mm. Because it uses so much less bandwidth. Yeah. That's fine if you want to get charged a lot. Um. Well, that would be your immediate family that you want to get in touch with to say, yeah. hey, I'm okay, or hey, I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's interesting. So, I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but I know here when there's been a big earthquake, everybody has a story. Does that sound familiar? I mean, it's like, oh, so what were you doing when the earthquake hit? And yeah. what happened to you? And, and what was it like? And, and there's, <laughs> it's, it's almost like, with earthquakes at least, I think they hit so quickly that after the fact you have to process them. Yeah. You know, the 1989 earthquake was 17 seconds long. Yeah. And it just was like this incredible catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> 17 seconds and bam, <laughs> you know, nothing's the same. You know, I highly recommend, there's a really wonderful um, documentary from, I believe it's ESPN, on uh, the World Series that was, that was stopped because of the earthquake. And it tells you the story of the series, but it also in great detail tells the story of the earthquake and it's actually quite fascinating because yeah. one of the things that becomes clear is and it, at least at least in an earthquake the effect is so widespread and so quick that you have absolutely no idea how bad it was in other locations mm -hmm. right and yeah. unless you're actually talking to those people or watching them on video you have you have no idea you know so you end up with people you know <laughs> the the in the in the documentary is <laughs> one of the guys was up in the lights of the stadium he was literally hanging on a light pole no oh, servicing the lights and all of a sudden he's hanging on for dear life as the light pole is going like this <laughs> yeah they talked to the guy and he was like, I was so convinced I was going to die. <laughs> wow. you know? um, but yeah, the people who were in the stadium actually didn't see a lot of effects. And so they were like, well, why is everybody canceling the game? <laughs> <laughs> I remember reading afterwards an analysis of, because of, in different parts of the area, some were on really solid, rocky ground. Mm -hmm. And some parts were on a, a softer soil, and yeah. the difference in the amount of damage yeah. that was done, depending on exactly where within the area you were because of the different ground types. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, if you're on a... Oh, the Mexico City earthquake was really terrible because that entire thing is this basin which was like a bowl of soup yeah. <laughs> when it came to when it came to an earthquake shaking yeah. So, yeah. yeah 
Uh, Brian, yeah, Brian's gone. Oh, well. <laughs> Poor Brian. He'll be back or not. He might be busy. Um, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is interesting in that way because, like, we don't really get hit with, like, that kind of stuff, like earthquakes. Although there was one that we, we it was rumored that we were supposed to have been able to feel, I think, a year and a half ago, too. <laughs> Apparently you didn't feel it, Reggie. <laughs> well, no, not on top of my mountain. I didn't feel it. Um, but I, I did have friends in other areas of Pennsylvania that had. Well, um, you know, there are. I mean, earthquakes are funny because sometimes they can crop up in the darndest places. I, there was, um, there was the one that happened in Washington D.C. Yeah. Just a couple years ago. Yeah. And, it, <laughs> and they had to. You know, completely redo the na the Washington Monument <laughs> because, oops, you know. Yeah. 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 So, for sure. Well, this is cool. You guys are awesome. Um, we covered a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wrote down Rain of Fire in my notes. Yay! So it will be in the report. Che says go watch Rain, and Fi Rain of Fire. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, right. It could have been more dragon. I have a person, I guess. Yeah. But, um... Well, you know, I mean, here's another famous disaster movie. The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh my Tornado. god. <laughs> That's perfect. Tornado. Well, I was going to say, going back to how people respond to, you know, in Tornado Alley before modern weather satellites, mm -hmm. pretty much any time you saw a storm brewing up, you were on the alert for the possibility of a tornado. Yeah. And everyone had a storm shelter, mm -hmm. uh, an underground space to go into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and you know what? That's um, We've mentioned this previously in the hour, but I think it's a good idea to think through if you've got a, a, a book you're writing and there's some kind of natural disaster stuff that happens. Um, yes that people are going to have ways that they prepare and and things that they have like storm sh you know storm shelters yeah um, or like we're talking about coastal houses being built up on stilts exactly yeah exactly uh, which I actually like most commonly we're not enough like i mean um like americans just build stuff like like with complete unconcern as to like where it's going or what the area is because it's like all this tract housing and that's just how you do it and that's how it's cheapest mm -hmm. and that's how it's been done for like you know the last I don't know 50 100 years um right summer homes. Summer you know homes where it's like you throw down a concrete slab slap up a house and you're done you know it doesn't matter if you're on a floodplain Ugh. yeah you know, it's it's like you are know, are you're not on a floodplain when the house was built, but someone <laughs> check, builds a dam somewhere downstream from you, and all of a sudden now you are on a floodplain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I do have I do have a natural disaster in my barn world, and <laughs> it's referred to in the Soul's Bargain story, and basically it's that that there was a sinkhole, um, but the sinkhole. <laughs> Changed the course of a river and it started pouring into the underground city. Yeah. And uh, so they had to do some some very quick things <laughs> to make sure the city didn't get completely filled up with water. <laughs> I just like sinkholes. Yes, I must have a thing for sinkholes. <laughs> no, actually, I was like, no, it was funny though because this is actually a good point for world building of a natural disaster because. Mm -hmm. When I first thought about it, I was like, well, naturally, um, you know, I don't know how it happened, but this river just mm -hmm. changed course. <laughs> yeah. Rivers do stuff like that, don't they? Right? I mean, they do, right? 
So I was like, well, so this river, it changed course, and it came into the city, and then there was this big deal, right? Um, <laughs> and then it was only after that that I started thinking, okay, why did the river change course, <laughs> right? Um, and that was how I got to the sinkhole, because I actually had to do a whole bunch of research on and this particular type of area and the particular type of ground that would have these kinds of caves in it and and all this kind of stuff you know I, I'm saying all I'm saying is that it wasn't originally sinkhole <laughs> it wasn't like oh I've just got a thing for sinkholes and <laughs> that should be your byline Julie <laughs> has Julie a Wade, who has a thing for safer sinkholes <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, like, I mean, you know, wh whenever you're writing, something is going to, like, you know, wh wh whatever, whatever, like, kind of um, you're interested in shows up inevitably somehow. So, like, if somebody does have a favorite natural disaster or lives around a favorite natural disaster um, and they want to put it in a book, they're, they're going to find a way. Like, it's, like, easy. Especially, like, if you've been through it, then you can kind of draw on that. Yeah. Um. Well, it's four o'clock, folks, and you guys are awesome as usual. So, <laughs> um, I believe next week we're talking about death and funerals. Oh, cool! Which should be kind of interesting, if a little bit dour. Uh, <laughs> it'll be Is fun. our lobby going to come to Possibly, that? possibly grim, uh, <laughs> but it should be very interesting. So um, we'll see how that goes, and um, I should be same bat time, same bat channel next week. Um, cool. I don't have another guest until June, so alrighty, I'm going to stop the broadcast. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. You're awesome.